Hey guys, what's going on? It's Don here from Nova Spirit Tech, and welcome back to the channel. And I got a super exciting episode for you guys, which is installing Proxmox onto our little Raspberry Pi. So let's get started. <laughs> So you guys know that I've been downsizing my server. So if you haven't seen that video, it's right over here where I am starting to decommission my Dell server and start to load everything into either my NAS or my Raspberry Pi for Dockers. This little bit of information came across my radar and it is the ability to install Proxmox into the Raspberry Pi. Now, if you guys are not familiar with what Proxmox is, it's basically a virtual machine server. So much like ESXi, you're allowed to run virtual machines inside this operating system. Proxmox is exactly the same, but now we're able to install it into the Raspberry Pi. Now, unfortunately, the only operating systems you're able to run are ARM-based operating systems like uh, Ubuntu ARM or Debian or anything that's ARM, maybe even Windows 10. While this GitHub says Pi Mox or like the Raspberry Pi Proxmox, you can actually install this on other devices that is not the Raspberry Pi. I have yet to try it, but it is possible you can manually install this on other devices. Now the install process is pretty simple. You do need a Raspberry Pi. Try to get as much RAM as possible because the more RAM, the more operating systems you can load. Two, you probably want to use this on an SSD. So USB SSD, that's where you want to go with. You can install this onto an SD card, but it's going to be extremely slow. So that's mainly what you need. Anyway, Let's jump into the process and I'll show you how simple it is to install it. First thing we need to do is either use your USB SSD or a SD card, either way you want to go. I've already been to this whole process. So I'm just showing you what I need to do to get this working. So I'm going to be using a four gigabyte SD card. Now I'm going to choose the operating system. And what we need to use is a 64 bit light version. We don't need the desktop. We don't need anything, but we do need the Raspberry Pi light operating system. Now I am using my Raspberry Pi 400. So if you're seeing Ubuntu 2204, I am testing this. If you want to see my first impressions on it, I'll leave a link over here for that video. But yeah, I'm going to be testing this on the Raspberry Pi 400 for quite some days because I find it to be a pretty interesting operating system for now, especially on such lightweight hardware. Uh, right now I'm just trying to plug in the SD card. And if I click storage, you should be able to see the four gigabyte SD card right here. There you go. Now the settings we do need to set, okay? Enable SSH, that is a must. Uh, set the username and password. So I'm just gonna use Raspberry. Uh, if you wanna use this through Wi-Fi, you can. You could configure your WAN over here. Uh, I mean your wireless internet over here. Um, I'm just gonna leave it like that and save the settings. Um, hit right, yes, and I forgot this does need the password for that. Now just give it a few minutes to let this write and then we can boot into the SD card. Okay, now that I plugged in my Raspberry Pi over there at my little station, uh, I'm gonna be able to SSH into it. But first thing I do need to show you is this GitHub, which I'll leave a link down in the description below on the instructions on how to install it or the manual install if you wanna install it on something other than the Raspberry Pi. Now, this is super simple. It's basically like two commands and you just run it, but it's there is a little bit of an issue with it on this particular version that I'm installing right now. As of seven days ago, it was still working, but when I tried to install this, it would not work and I did discover what the problem was. So we do have to go in and modify the source code a little bit. Now, I'm not sure if this is gonna happen in the future, but keep in mind these dates. Uh, right now, the last time it was updated was March 4th. So that was a couple of months ago. And anytime that is updated later than what it is now, maybe they fixed the problem. But for now, there is still this pending issue where the most recent kernel of the Raspberry Pi does not match up with what it needs for Proxmox to run which has to do with something on the DKMS and stuff like that. I'm not gonna get into too much detail, but we do have to modify a line. So first thing we need to do is jump over and SSH to our Raspberry Pi. So if my um, DNS picked it up, I should be able to go to Pi Raspberry Pi and it should pick up. But if it didn't, I do know the IP. Oh, it worked. There you go. Uh, Raspberry was the password I chose. So from here on, the first thing you need to do is grab this part, which is curl this little command right over here. And what you do want to do is run this in sudo. So sudo s. And here I'm just going to go paste that little thing that I just copied. 
and hit enter. Now we're not going to run it yet like they said over here. What we're going to do now is nano r pi and go down to about line 148. So I'm just going to page down a bit. Control C to find the line and let's see. It's actually this line right here, 145. So in this line it says app update, app upgrade, and app install Raspberry Pi kernel headers. By installing the latest kernel headers, it actually stops the DKMS from installing. So we need to remove this little bit. So what I would do is basically hit enter on the two ampersands or the two and signs, and then put pound signs after that. So it will eliminate that part. You can still perform the upgrade. You just can't install the Raspberry Pi kernel headers. Once you're done with that, you could save it. Uh, since this is not an executable, we do have to ch mod and turn this into an executable. So now it should be an executable. And we could run this now, rpi install. Now it's gonna go through a series of questions of what you want the host name to be and stuff like that. So you could name this anything you want. I could just leave it like rpi-proxmox. Um, the IP address that you want to assign it. So I am going to assign it 215. Oops. We basically got to do the slash 24. 192.168.105.215 slash 24. Uh, correct gateway. Yes, that is. And are you okay with these changes? Yes, I am. And set up new root password. So this is going to be the login root, not the ssh into the pi so the root login so you could just put whatever password you want in here and give this about 25 minutes go grab a coffee do hang out whatever you want this does take a while to install so go and grab a coffee or something and then we'll be right back so i'm just going to flash the screen where this is all done and i'm going to be jumping onto my normal desktop because i recorded this yesterday so yeah we're going to jump into that. So here we have the Proxmox up. I already logged in and my IP address is this one. It will actually display what IP address you have to use, but the port is 8006, which is normal for Proxmox. Now, I have a couple of VMs running already and you can see it's only using about 2% of the CPU because these two VMs are just idling and I'm using about four gigs of RAM. Now I do recommend enlarging the swap space so because it will touch this at times and then you don't want your system to run out of swap or RAM and it'll just crash. So this is something you probably want to adjust. So let's go ahead and do that first while we're at it. So we're going to head into shell. So, and since this is uh, a Raspberry Pi OS, we are using D physical D phys or something. So I'm going to CD into ETC nano D P H Y swap file. And you can see in here, it says a hundred. And let's just make this to one gig, just in case. If you got an SSD, this is fine, if it's gonna use this as a swap space. But that's what I would recommend using. And I wouldn't use uh, ZRAM on this because every little bit of CPU you can keep is something you wanna do. So ZRAM, while giving you pretty fast RAM storage because it's compressing through the CPU and all that stuff, you want to try to reduce as much CPU usage as possible. So I'm just going to be physically using a regular swap file that will run off my SSD. So once that is done, if you reboot the system, it'll give you uh, one gig of RAM. I'll worry about that a little bit later, but jumping into creating a VM. So we're going to do this from scratch. Now, first thing we need to do is locate an ISO file, some, something with an installer. So you can't just use the regular Raspberry Pi image or a Manjaro image or whatever image for the Raspberry Pi. It has to be an installer. So we only have a handful of those. Uh, Debian is one, Ubuntu is another. If you find another type of installer, you might be able to install it through here as well. So what I'm gonna do is go into Google and type in Debian CD images. And in here, you could just locate what you want. So I'm gonna to go to releases, the current one. So let's just do that. And we're gonna look for our system, which would be ARM64, unless you wanna use ARM hard float, but ARM64 is what we're gonna use. Uh, we're gonna, we could either download the DVD or the ISO. The DVD is uh, 3.7 gigs, which will provide you with everything. That means you don't have to do a net install or download anything you want off the internet. Or if you want to keep it small, you could do the ISO CD, which is only about 320 megabytes. So what I'm going to do here is right click, 
copy link because we don't have to download it and upload it to Proxmox, not from version seven and on, but the older versions you might have to. But anyway, in this one, you could just download from URL, paste the URL link that you just got and name the ISO. So if you don't name it, it'll just keep this name. But since I downloaded once already, I'm just gonna rename this to dev11.iso and I'm gonna hit download. From here, just give it a couple of minutes. 320 megabytes is very small, so it should be able to download this pretty quick. And once this is done, I'm gonna show you guys how to create a VM because it's not the standard VM that you would have to create. I'll show you in a second. It's pretty standard, but we do have to do some techniques. Okay, once this is done, we're gonna jump into create a VM. And here, you, it's 103. If you name it, it will be whatever name you want. But if you don't, it'll just say VM103. So I'm just going to name this Deb11-2 because it's my second Debian. So I'm going to go next. Here, in the CD-ROM, you want to do no media because we're going to delete this uh, drive. We're going to hit next. From here, we go into BIOS and change over to UEFI. And we're going to create a UEFI disk. So we're just going to create that in the settings. Next. As far as the hard drive space goes, keep this as SCSI. Um, you could use your local storage. My disk size, I like to go by 32, 64, 96, 128. That's my style. Uh, a lot of my friends and coworkers like to use 40, 80, 120. So it's user preference on this. So I'll just keep this as 32 because that's more than enough. Next, CPUs or sockets. I would keep one socket and probably one or two cores because you know it's a Raspberry Pi, we only got four cores, so you are limited to the CPU processes. But keep in mind, I do have two VMs running and it's only using about 2% of CPU usage, which means you could create more VMs and add two cores. You could even go up to six cores or eight cores or whatever the case may be, as long as you're only not overloading your system. Like if I have three VMs with two cores each, and I'm only using one, it's only gonna be using those two cores, like 50% of your CPU, while the other two are idle. That's fine, because you could set those options. As long as you're not using all three VMs at the same time at 100%, then you won't overload your system. So I'm just gonna keep it at two. Memory, uh, two gigs is fine. We're using the eight gigabyte Raspberry Pi. So depending on what operating system you're gonna throw in there, that's your limiting factor. So two gigs of RAM, next. Uh, this one you could keep standard, uh, depending on the operating system you're using, you might want to change this, but I'll just keep this as virtual IO or vert IO. And then you just confirm, give this a few minutes, maybe a minute or less. You will see this lock icon. It's not going to do anything. It's trying to create the drive. It's trying to do all the stuff in the back end. Once that lock icon is finished, then you could actually go in and edit the settings. So in here, what I'm going to do is go into hardware and delete that hard CD-ROM drive. So remove, yes, and I'm gonna add a CD-ROM drive. The reason is because it doesn't support IDE. So the kernel that we have in here or the ARM doesn't have IDE built in, I guess. So it won't work with IDE, so we would need to use SCSI. So SCSI, you could keep this as number two or you could change it, it's fine. And then this is where you would actually load in the Debian install that you just have. So I downloaded this one, Debian11.iso, create. Now when you're done with this, Go over to options and you're going to have to change the boot order from SCSI 2 and just click and drag that all the way to the top. So that's the first thing to boot up. Hit OK. And that is it. Now, other things that I would set up is probably the guest agent. And yeah, if you want to change or use a different type of graphic card instead of the standard VGA, you can change that as well. As soon as you hit play or start, you can head over to console and Given this a few minutes, it's not the fastest thing in the world, but it does get the job done. Now, I'm not gonna go through the whole install process because I already did, so I'm gonna show you one installation that I already got with Debian, and just to show you guys what's going on with it, and what works, what doesn't work, etc., etc. All right, here we are. This is the Debian that I got over here. It's already installed. I do have some, well, it's the default installation, so I don't have any applications installed, but you could see it's actually pretty responsive. It's only running two cores with two gigs of RAM and I'm able to interface with this VM pretty uh, responsively, if that's the word. I could go into folders, I could do whatever I want, uh, say if I want to open terminal, that's pretty quick as well. So yeah, you could fully use this 
as a VM if you wanted to, especially if you are, what I would use this for in my sense is a throwaway PC. If I needed to look up something that I know is suspicious or a website that's suspicious and I want to see what's going on or if I needed to open onion links or something like that, I would probably throw it in one of these VMs keep a snapshot or a backup of it and then restore it if something happens and put that on a VPN or something like that. That's that's my use of this because it's a perfect throwaway PC. But anyway, to jump onto this, uh, what works in this guy is USB. Uh, USB pass-through works. Now, you do have to change it so it's not USB 3 because USB 3 will break the system. So just uncheck that. And I forwarded a webcam over so if you were to see, let me pop into my console and I'll open, what do you call the application? Cheese, multimedia, cheese. You should be able to see the webcam come up and there it is. Now I'm gonna turn that off because that's in a different angle because that's where my server is. But yeah, uh, USB pass-through does work. Uh, another thing that does work is the QEMU guest agent. So I do have that installed. This way is why it's able to see my IP address over here. And I could see more information, which is over here. Or if you got VPN set up and stuff like that, it'll come up here as well. And it helps manage like some of the stuff internally, like memory and CPU, it gets a better rate at it. So um, yeah, having a guest agent is pretty good. Now, what doesn't work is snapshot. I tried snapshotting a couple of times with different techniques and it's not able to snapshot, so don't do it. It might break the system and requires you to remove the entire operating system or the snapshot itself. But backup does work. Uh, it does take a while because we are running on a USB hard drive. So when you're backing this up, it does literally take maybe 25 minutes for something that's 32 gigs. So backup does work, which is good because if I do that throwaway system, I could always restore from backup, which takes a little bit longer, but at least I still have some something. Now I tried to install Windows 11 or Windows 10 on this guy, even though I have the ISO. It still doesn't want to install. There might be some techniques behind it that I have to do, but when I try to run the CD and the ISO image, the display does not initialize. I know it's loading in the background because I see the CPU usage and stuff like that, but it's not initializing the, the, the display. So I might have to play around with that and change it to Red Hat or something like that and see if what would work as far as the display goes. Other than that, yeah, it does work. I also installed Ubuntu 22 on here and going into console, this is how it would look like. This is using a 1080 resolution. It's not the fastest in the world, but it does work. So if I go into the menu, actually, 22 is a little bit sluggish on running on a small VM like this. It's a little sluggish on the Raspberry Pi in general. So uh, the performance is not as great as if you were to use Debian. So if you're gonna use any system, I would try to keep it as lightweight as possible. So Debian XFCE works great. Just clicking on that took like a few seconds just to get the uh, folder menu up. So yeah, I wouldn't recommend running the 22. I'm just testing some stuff out here and it works, but not the greatest. Anyway. That is it for me guys. That's my experience with Proxmox so far. What I do like is that you could actually install this onto other systems that are a little bit more powerful because you know it, Raspberry Pi is not the strongest ARM CPU out there. So I would like to try this on another ARM CPU that's probably more cores and more RAM. But for now, Proxmox on a Raspberry Pi or Proxmox on ARM is a huge achievement. Anyway, if you guys got any questions about this, hit me up on Discord or on the comments down below. If you guys are new to this channel, consider subscribing and also hitting that bell notification icon so you know when the next video is going to be out. And then say my nerd cave, hack till it hurts.